I was a wayward child with the weight of the world that I held deep inside. Life was a winding road, and I learned many things little ones shouldn't know. But I closed my eyes, steady my feet on the ground, raised my head to the sky, and the times roll by. Still, I feel like that child as I look at the moon. Maybe I grew up a little too soon. Mariah Carey was born on March 27, 1969, in Huntington, New York, to parents Alfred and Patricia Carey. She was the youngest of three with an older brother named Morgan and an older sister named Allison. In her book, The Meaning of Mariah Carey, Mariah writes that her earliest childhood memories were plagued with violence, cops, and abuse. She writes, Some of my earliest memories are of violent moments. Because of that, I have always carried around a heavy blanket with which I cover up large pieces of my childhood. It has been a burden. Well, there was a lot of unrest in my household, if there was a household. Um, And, you know, I had uh, difficulty with having come from such a dysfunctional family, I needed to kind of heal myself and heal that inner child of, that I tried to keep alive through all of the dysfunction and mess. Listen, you grew up biracial in a white neighborhood, no big deal now, but there certainly was a struggle for you mm-hmm. to fit in. There was a series of things that happened to you that I thought was very traumatic. I, I didn't really feel accepted in any one's particular world. Mm-hmm. And this is like in one of the songs that I, um, It's one of my favorite songs that I've done. It's called Outside. And I talk about feeling ambiguous without a sense of belonging to touch somewhere halfway. Like these are things that I've been talking about for a long time. So it's like people are like, oh, you know, she's talking in this book now. But I really, I always felt like I was expressing that. Your family life was complicated. Growing up in an interracial family with her mother being white and her father black and Venezuelan, Mariah often felt unworthy and excluded not just from the outside world, but also within her family dynamics. Writing, there was a time in my early childhood when I didn't believe I was worthy of being alive. Nowhere in the world did I see anyone who looked like me. My sister Allison and brother Morgan were both older and darker, and not just in terms of the hues of their skin, though they were slightly browner. The two of them had a similar energy that seemed to block light. Mariah's brother Morgan was a troubled boy, whose anger was unmatched. Breaking into violent outbursts and rage was quite common for him. Inside, he carried a lot of pain, anger, and resentment. Mariah writes, I always thought of my brother's anger as weather, powerful, destructive, and unpredictable. I don't know if it was a singular act or an ongoing illness that made him so volatile. When my brother was around, it was not uncommon for holes to be punched in the walls or for other objects to go flying. More often, I felt I had to protect myself from him. And sometimes I would find myself protecting my mother from him, too. Can you just sort of summarize? You had a brother who was enraged. Extremely violent, yes. And unpredictably so. So the the thing when you're living in an environment where you don't know where it's going to come from, you're always constantly walking on eggshells in Mm -hmm. a state of anxiety yourself. And a sister who, I don't know, how would you describe your sister I would say troubled. I I would say traumatized. The Carey's household was filled with physical altercations, conflict, and toxicity. In addition to these issues, they also dealt with ridicule and discrimination. At that time, they lived in a mostly white community on Long Island as an interracial family. When walking in their neighborhood, they would often split up so as not to be seen together. Mariah explains that her mother would always walk ahead of them and enter into their house first, with her father entering in last. Were you ostracized by your own family? What happened with your own family? Well, when I told my mother that I was going to marry a black man, um, she was very upset. She had the priest call me. And then I got married because I was in love with him and um, I just felt it was the right thing to do. And did the family disown you afterwards? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, what, like... You still disowned or no, were you able my to mother make peace died. about it? Yes. My mother died. But for years and years, she never even told her brothers and sisters, sister, uh, that I was married. I would go home to her house for, you know, an occasion, generally a funeral. But you could not bring Mariah's father Oh, no. Home. No. 
And, uh, and I, that was clear to you that you could not. Absolutely. This is all before I was born. And I abided by her wishes. I didn't talk. I didn't. I just avoided it. I didn't tell anyone I was married. No one asked me. But in the neighborhood where you lived with your black husband, mm -hmm. people knew you were married. So how you, how were you treated then? Did you move into a black neighborhood, white neighborhood, mixed neighborhood? Initially, we moved into a white neighborhood, and I was the person who purchased the house because we knew that if he came with me, we wouldn't get the house. There wasn't anything overt that happened in that house. But then I thought, you know, I looked around the neighborhood and I said, what a way to raise two children. There are no black people here. Let's find a mixed neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And you did? Impossible. It was impossible. I mean, we went to a mixed neighborhood. And then what happened was the black children didn't like my children because one of them looked whiter than the other. And the white children didn't like the other child who looked a little darker. The discrimination that the Carey suffered from would be one of many stressors in their family. In addition to dealing with racism, Alfred was abusive and Patricia was emotionally detached. These issues intensified, which led to them getting divorced when Mariah was just three years old. When her parents separated, she and her brother Morgan relocated with their mother while Allison stayed with their father, a decision that severely damaged her in the years to come. Mariah writes, quote, By the time my siblings were teens, my brother had been institutionalized, placed in the precarious care of the state, and my sister was pregnant by her 16th birthday. My sister and brother clearly couldn't stand each other, but their deep resentment toward me was a constant silent menace, simmering right below the surface. I was what they considered a golden child, lighter hair, lighter skin, and a lighter spirit. I lived with my mother, and they were exiled from each other and us. They existed in a different kind of pain, absorbing whatever hostility, underloved, troubled, mixed kids do in any neighborhood. I believed, they believed, I was passing. There I was, with my blondish hair, living with our white mother in what they considered a safe white neighborhood, while they lived with our dad in Harlem. Their resentment toward me was perhaps the one thing they had in common. They seemed bound in that bitterness. The wedge in Mariah Carey's family was put in place long ago when Allison and Mariah were growing up on Long Island. Were you ever jealous of her? Yes, of course. You know, she, she was very popular. She had a lot of friends. I didn't have any friends. The parents separated when Allison was 11. She says she was sent to live with her father. Her mother is white. Her father is black. Mariah, however, rarely speaks about her interracial heritage. My parents made me say I am an interracial child, okay, which is going to alienate you right there. My mother said nothing like that will ever happen to Mariah. I won't let it happen. Though Morgan and Allison resented Mariah, Mariah's life with their mother wasn't ideal. Her mother worked a lot, often leaving her home alone. She was unkempt, without proper clothes, and often neglected. There was hardly any food in the house, and they moved constantly. On top of that, their home became a revolving door for men. Morgan and Allison thought that Mariah was living the good life, when in reality she claims that her life was just as bad as theirs. How would you describe the neglect? I think it's really a tough job to be a mother. So that said, I would say the neglect was on several levels. I always felt dirty. I didn't feel put together, leaving me with people that were not safe. And also being one of those people that wasn't always um, safe for me either, emotionally. Yes, and on both sides of the spectrum. Because it wasn't that I didn't like my hair when it was behaving, but as I... <laughs> It grew up a little bit. It went from baby hair to like matted, unruly hair that nobody was combing through or understanding that you can't have a little girl running around with mats in her head. Mariah had experienced a lot of trauma and neglect at such an early age. In order to cope with it, she turned to music. Her mother, Patricia, was a trained Juilliard opera singer that encouraged her to pursue this profession. By the time Mariah was 12, she was already making a name and career for herself. She writes, singing was a form of escapism for me, and writing was a form of processing. There was joy in it, but it mainly was survival. My voice was recognized as pure talent, not only by my mother, but also by my teachers. By the time I was 11 or 12, my mother was taking me to a club on Long Island to sit in with her and other musicians. 
I was in the sixth grade, up there at all hours of the night, any day of the week, sitting in with grown musicians. In a world that seems so troubled, Mariah found refuge in music. Music has always been my saving grace. It's always been what has made me feel special when I didn't feel special or I felt like I didn't belong, whatever. That made me feel special. In high school, while most other 16-year-olds were living normal teenage lives, Mariah was fleeing Long Island for Manhattan at every chance to write music with a partner, sometimes until three in the morning. Most mothers would have been uh, terrified letting their 16-year-old go to New York, stay up all night writing music with uh, some young partner, some young man. Weren't you concerned? I I really wasn't, because I knew that's what she was going to do. I knew that she was carving out her life and that she was going to be a singer. This molding helped nurture Mariah into the global star she is today. Though Mariah acknowledges how her mother encouraged her and truly believed in her talents, she also expresses that despite her mother's encouragement and nurturing of her talents, they had and continue to have, quote, a relationship of persistent turmoil, competition, jealousy, and neglect. Um, I want to focus on your mother because I thought it was interesting when you said, listen, uh, jealousy comes with the territory when you're famous. But when it comes from your mother, it's very painful. Can you talk about that dynamic? I didn't know that your mom was a singer, too. Yes. My mother um, is a very talented singer. She went to Juilliard. She's an opera singer. I've always credited her with exposing me to music, um, with uh, really kind of saying, don't say if I make it, say when I make it. So I think, you know, there's it's, it's such a complicated relationship. It is complicated. And I also thought that it was very difficult to me to read because there's here you are, you're starting your career and your mom's singing. And she says, you should only hope that you could be half the singer that I am. It definitely had an effect on me. Um, I don't even know that she would even remember that. Yeah, that one statement did live with me for the rest of my life, though. So it's like you have to be so careful what you say and. With Mariah focused on her music career, her siblings were going through a lot of upheaval in their lives. Allison, who upon getting pregnant at the age of 16, married the father of her child and moved to the Philippines where he was stationed in the army, was back. When Allison returned to New York, she was divorced and selling her body for money and drugs. Mariah writes, I was about 12 years old and she was 20. Whatever had happened to her had taken its toll. There was one older man, I guessed he was about 60. One evening, for some unknown reason, Allison took me with her to his house. When we arrived, Allison sat me down on a light brown couch and handed me a little chalky ice blue pill with a crease carved down the middle and a glass of water. Here, take this, she said. I took it. Within minutes, I was in a heavy, scary darkness, pushed down into a place beneath sleep, and I couldn't pull myself out. Allison gave me a whole volume. I don't know why my sister drugged me. I don't know why my mother let me go with her and this man. I learned many things that little ones shouldn't know. Part of this had to do with your sister. It's on the record uh, that when you were very young, she was on drugs. Yes? Okay. That she uh, was a prostitute? You must have known this. What was it like for a little girl? It was a very difficult thing to see, Um, but I think what it did for me was provide me with an inner strength and something I knew that I didn't want to be. That's why I will never be a promiscuous person. I will never be on drugs. I'll never be too out of it to know what I'm doing or getting myself into. Allison's life was in complete turmoil, and according to Mariah, it seemed as though she wanted to take her down the same path. On another occasion, Allison introduced Mariah to a man named John, who Mariah says in the book was a pimp. She details the following incident. Quote, One day, she explained that it was time for me to meet her fabulous boyfriend, John, and the other girls who she hung around. They all lived in this house together. My sister told me not to tell anyone, especially my brother. One day, my sister got me my own phone line. She called and said that she and John were coming to pick me up. I was excited. John showed up alone. We began driving and ended up at a drive-in. 
John immediately put his arm around me. My body went stiff. My eyes were fixed on his firearm in his lap. He pushed in closer and forced a hard kiss on me. I was nauseous and scared. I felt immobilized. From the corner of my eye, I noticed an elderly man pull up and park next to us, peering directly into John's car. He clearly saw an adult man, John, with a little girl, me. John pulled out of the drive-in slowly and drove me home in silence. After this incident, Mariah ceased any and all communication with Allison, but would eventually let her back into her life shortly after. What transpired upon their reconciliation would forever damage their relationship. Mariah writes, She was looking down at her mug of still steaming tea in her hand, and when she lifted her face, her eyes were rabid. In a flash, she threw the boiling hot tea on me. My back was splattered with third-degree burns. The horrific physical sensation had been so intense that I blacked out. The deepest injury, though, was from the emotional trauma. Feelings are not like skin. There are no fresh new cells coming to replace ruined ones. Those scars go unseen, unacknowledged, and unhealed. The truly irreversible damage to me came from the burn of my big sister, not the tea. Her arson was deliberate. She burned my back and my trust. Any faint hope I'd held up to that point of having a big sister became scorched earth. Through the years, both my sister and brother have put me on the chopping block, sold lies to any gossip rag or trashy website that would buy or listen. They have attacked me for decades, but when I was 12 years old, my sister drugged me with Valium, offered me a pinky nail of cocaine, inflicted me with third-degree burns, and tried to sell me out to a pimp. Something in me was arrested by all that trauma. That is why I often say I'm eternally 12. At 16, Allison was already married and a mother, but she didn't stay home. Instead, she turned to the streets for money. I want to ask you about one of the more difficult things in your life. How did you get into prostitution? Nobody wanted to hire me. I didn't have any experience doing anything. I knew I had to get a job, but I couldn't find one. Yeah. Hello. For her younger sister, Mariah, life was far different. When she was 12 years old, she decided she was going to become popular. People were going to think she was beautiful. Mariah's eye was on the goal. The music it was everything. I want to go on record as saying that um, I love my sister. And um, she's broken my heart so many times. Mariah's adolescent years were challenging, not only because of her tumultuous relationship with her siblings, her tragic relationship with her parents, but also because she hardly had any friends and was constantly bullied at school. This isolation, however, helped Mariah focus on her music, her talents, and her craft. When she was in the seventh grade, Mariah would have her first professional recording session by doing background vocals. By the time she was 15, she was writing songs and recording background vocals and jingles for local businesses. Upon graduating high school, Mariah moved to New York City, where her brother introduced her to a producer named Gavin Christopher. When Mariah moved to Manhattan, she was 17 years old, broke and ambitious. She writes, It was the 1980s, and it was like one big, funky, moving art gallery. The main avenues were grand, crowded catwalks filled with eclectic fashion models, business moguls, street hustlers, and workers of every ilk. Everyone had somewhere to go and something to do. It was a mad and fabulous planet of concrete and crystals populated with misfits, magicians, dreamers, and dealers. I landed right in the middle of it. Hello, baby. I was made for this. Upon arriving in Manhattan, Mariah picked up odd jobs to make extra money as she pursued her music career. Eventually, she was introduced to another producer. She writes, Ben and I worked incessantly on my demo for over a year or so. We were able to create a full demo that I thought really showed my songwriting and vocal skills. Ben suggested we have some security in place by way of a formal agreement. With no parent, legal counsel, manager, or even a good friend, I signed it. I was maybe 18 years old. We started setting up meetings with record companies and things began to move fast. Later on, Mariah would be informed what her contract with Ben really entailed, writing, quote, I didn't realize the enormity of what I had signed away. I was informed that he got 50% of the publishing on all songs we worked on together for my first album. Okay, fine. But additionally, he received 50% of my artist's royalties for the first album. 
40% for the second, 30% for the third, and so on. It went on that way from 1990 until about 1999. I met this guy named Ben Margulies. We worked in his dad's studio, which for the time, I was lucky to be at any studio. It was a small studio in the back of a wood shop. I guess they must have had some money because I surely didn't. They were like 25, 26, and I was a kid in high school. So I was just happy to be there um, working and writing. So I started working with Ben. So when I was signing my deal, even though I signed like the worst deal in history, because it was really? through that production company, the P- yeah, I don't know if it's the worst deal in history is pretty bad. But the one thing, thank God, I didn't do was sell my publishing for $5,000. Oh, that, yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was Smart. presented me as an option. So $5,000 sounded like $500 million to me at that point. Mm-hmm. And luckily I didn't because I had seen a documentary on the Beatles and their whole thing and what they gave away. At the time, Mariah had no idea about the deal she made with Ben. But in the meantime, she had her demo in hand and set out to make it in the music industry. Once Mariah broke into the inner circle of background vocalists in New York City, things really began to take off. Upon doing background vocals for singer Brenda K. Starr, Mariah would meet the man that would put her on the map, Tommy Mottola, the president of Sony Music. She writes, One night, Brenda announced, I'm going to take you to this party, and you're going to meet a big record executive, Jerry Greenberg, and it's going to be great. Actually, what happened was I was a backup singer right out of high school for Brenda K. Starr who had a hit song called I Still Believe, which I actually recently did a remake of. And she took me under her wing. She was like a big sister to me. And it was great because a lot of people wouldn't have been like that with someone that they they might have felt threatened. You know what I mean? She didn't. She was just like always like, you got to listen to my friend Mariah. She writes her own songs. These are her songs. You know, she would like tell anybody and their brother, like try and give people my demo tape. And Brenda called me and said, you got to come to this party because, you know, it's going to be a lot of executives there. And I was like, well, you know, I already have this thing in place. I'm not sure what's going on. So I decided to go. And I went to her house and I had only one dress. She let me close. She let me this little mini skirt. And all I had was like my little Abrex jacket that I used to wear in high school, which basically looks like a cheerleading jacket. You know, I mean, I looked probably 12 and the only thing she couldn't let, but, but with this little skirt on and this whole little done up thing, the only thing she couldn't lend me were my shoes because my feet were too big. So I had on sneakers with this whole ensemble. Yeah. So it wasn't banging, wasn't very good look, but I guess it, whatever. It was October 1988, and this party was filled with aspiring artists. Though Brenda had planned to introduce Mariah to Jerry, things wouldn't go particularly according to plan. When the Italian hitmaker Tommy Mottola saw Mariah, he intercepted this plan. Mariah writes, Tommy said to Brenda, who's your friend? Brenda directed her answer to Jerry. She's 18 years old. Her name is Mariah. You've got to listen to this. Just as she went to hand Jerry my demo tape, Tommy's hand swiftly cut her off mid-extension. He snatched the tape, got up, left the table, and left the party. It was bizarre and bewildering. I was like, what kind of crap is this? And she actually wanted to hand the tape to Jerry Greenberg, um, who she knew from, I think it was Atlantic Records. And she brought me there to meet him. And instead, Tommy came up and grabbed the tape out of her hand. When she went, she said, here, Jerry, and Tommy snatched it out of his hand. So he took the tape and it didn't even have my the label on it the right way. It just said Brenda K. Star rehearsal. With Mariah's demo tape in hand, Tommy immediately left the party, went out to his limo and popped the tape in. What he heard next stopped him in his tracks. In his book, The Hitmaker, he writes, I slipped the tape into the player. At first I thought there was some mistake. This couldn't be the blonde chick that I met. I waited for the next song. It blew me away. It was amazing music, an amazing voice. An unbelievable energy was running through me, screaming, turn the car around. That may be the best voice you've heard in your entire life. Tommy jumped out of his limo, ran back to the party, searching for that blonde girl whose voice belted out on that tape. But to his disappointment, she was gone. Mariah had already left the party. What was like, what was Tommy like? We've heard so much about him. You know, um... I'm just, I'm not, I'm not a fan. 
I think the only reason why I gave Tommy Mariah's music was because I know of him. I know his caliber. He knew of me and I've seen him plenty of times at Arthur Baker's studio. And I wasn't even thinking about the relationship him and I had. I was thinking more about my friend getting my friend through the door because my friend didn't have much of anything and I wanted to help her. And I felt that she was super talented and, and there's room for all of us. And that's why I did it. And, um, I think that I felt like Tommy was a very, um, he was a really dominating type of person. And, and I kind of felt like in his presence, I just didn't feel like, like he was power in music, but I also felt like he can crush you if he wanted to. Tommy had a lot of power in the music industry as he was the president of Sony Music at the time. With major connections, it would take only three days for Tommy to track Mariah down. When he did, she was living with friends, sleeping on a mattress in a dump, and eager to sign a record deal. Mariah signed to Sony Music at the age of 18. He writes, I told my business affairs department, I don't care if you lock her lawyer in your conference room. Do not let him out until you have a deal. Once it was signed, Mariah got in advance to move out of her girlfriend's apartment, got her own place, and started working on her first album. You know, worked it out. Worked it out. Made a deal. Made a deal. But did he say then... I had a lawyer when we made the actual okay, deal, no. but at that but, point... But did he say, you're going to be, you have something, you know, this is the best voice I've heard in a long time, or anything like that? Yes, he... Uh, he I mean, was, he... But he definitely made me believe that he believed in me as much as I believed in myself, which was a huge decision-making factor in me going there because I could have ended up, I would have been at Warner in Warner's. Yeah. yeah. To Mariah, this was a dream come true. She spent years developing her talent, and now she had an amazing record deal with one of the leading record companies in the world, with the president of that company seriously invested in her. Tommy explains how he poured everything into Mariah. He saw her raw talent and knew that she would be a star. Mariah writes, I became his new star just as he was beginning a huge position at a new label. So he had the influence to clear the runway for my ascension into the sky. He was willing to move heaven and earth to make me successful. Soon after we met, Tommy started making romantic overtures. Matola spent money. I reported 800000 on the album, half a million dollars on the first video, and a million dollars more to market both. The feeling is that he made you, his guidance, his helping you choose the songs, his publicity machine, his this, his that, that it wouldn't have happened without him. Well, I don't, I don't believe that because I know that I wouldn't have given up. And I do know that I was very close to having a deal prior to meeting him. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that he was very instrumental because he did see the potential. So here you were, 19? Mm -hmm. Okay. And he was 20 years older and he's interested in you romantically. What did you think? And he was married, by the way. Well, well, he said he was separated. I don't, whatever. But I don't want to play psychologist. But twenty years older than you, Tommy Mottola, was he a father figure? Probably. When Tommy met Mariah, she was eighteen and he was forty. He was married with two children and writes that he was unhappy in his marriage and had been for a very long time. Quote: We had a great chemistry when we talked about the music. And when it came to work, she was as obsessed and fanatical as I was. Mariah had been flirtatious from the moment I set eyes on her at the launch party. I did everything in my power to resist. But a few months later, there was a moment when it all began to change. I had just come back from a business trip to Miami with Gloria and Emilio Estefan. I was wearing a jacket and tie and had a great Miami tan when I went to the studio to see how Mariah was doing. Mariah looked at me and said, you look great. The tone of her voice went beyond my clothes and the tan, and everything went into slow motion. I looked into her eyes, and she stared back at me, and then we quickly turned back to work. Those three words, you look great, were intoxicating to me. Those three words opened the door to a 40-year-old's crisis, and I stepped right on through. After a while, I went to see my therapist about it. I told her how Mariah and I had met, how she looked at me, how she made me feel. I told her, I'm falling in love with this girl. According to Tommy, his therapist thought he was crazy. 
and that he had lost his mind trying to pursue someone so much younger than him when he was still married with children. His therapist and friends tried to talk him out of this, to no avail. He writes, Tom, she said, stop right there. Forget it. It's not going to work. My therapist tried to make me see that I'd been blinded, and she listed the reasons why it couldn't possibly work. I didn't want to see that Mariah was from a broken family and had grown up without her father around, and for the most part had gotten by on her own. What didn't work, the way I saw it, was the marriage that I was in, and what did work was the strong bond based in music that I'd seen between Gloria and Emilio Estefan. I'd seen that bond work for Sharon and Ozzy Osbourne, and later I would come to see how it worked for Celine Dion and Renee Angelil. Renee is 26 years older than Celine. He launched her and manages her career. Age doesn't matter when it works. When it works, it works. Now, you know, that's the cardinal sin in the business is you, you can't sleep with the artist if you're the executive. There you go. And, and I know you went to see a therapist when you when you first. <laughs> yeah, the only, problem, did, only, pro <laughs> only problem is I didn't listen to the you therapist. You didn't listen to the therapist. <laughs> Tommy, you didn't listen to the therapist. The hell man. good was the therapist? You know, right? Uh, who came on to who first when oh, you and Mariah first got together? I ain't going there. You're not going to do it? <laughs> well, it's an excerpt from the book. Yeah. That says Mariah was really flirtatious from the first time you guys met. According to Tommy, though he tried to justify his pursuit of Mariah, no one supported it, with his therapist being the most vocal about it, writing, My therapist kept trying to make me see Mariah as someone who'd been through a difficult childhood. All I could see was what Mariah was about to become. You don't understand, I told my therapist. Mariah is going to be the biggest star in the world. She's going to be as big as Michael Jackson. The therapist took a deep breath and stared at me, as if I were totally delusional. Great, she said. Then just develop her as a recording artist. This is a girl who's had a lot of family issues. Remember, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Tom, don't do it. I didn't like hearing the word don't come out of her mouth. The sound of that word did everything she didn't intend it to do. It was as if she'd thrown kerosene on a fire. Smashing through the word no was a big reason for my success. Just as I had willed everything to work in my career, I believed I could also will Mariah and me to work out. Mariah is, look, one of the greatest talents in the world and certainly a beautiful uh, uh, woman and girl. And so, you know, the, the, the relationship really came out of working that intensely together. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it was, it was, it turned into you know, a 24 seven situation where we were working that hard on trying to get that first album done. Mm -hmm. It took a year and a half or more, almost two years, Wow! you know? And so, you know, it, there, there was a lot of, um, a lot of intense working together and, and out of that became a, a friendship and a relationship. Yeah. Cause she cooked, dude. That's the big question. What was that? Cause she cook. Uh... Tommy and Mariah's relationship was all encompassing. In her book, she writes that the relationship developed quickly, as Tommy was very assertive and aggressive. Due to his status, he had a brazen confidence that she found attractive. Mariah writes that he was a combination of a father figure and Spengali presence to her. Quote, For me, Tommy was a potent combination of a father figure, Spengali, business partner, confidant, and companion. There was never really a strong sexual or physical attraction there, but at the time, I needed safety and stability, a sense of home, more than I needed a boyfriend. Tommy understood that, and he provided. Eventually, Tommy was able to convince Mariah to give up her first apartment she purchased with her own money and move in with him. According to Mariah, that is when things started to slowly yet surely change. She writes, Tommy was 21 years older than me. He could have been my father. He was also the head of my label. There was no wise woman around me to point out that the power dynamic in our relationship was nowhere near 50-50. With a no parental or familial management or protection, I was easy to manipulate. But the dynamic of my relationship with Tommy was complex. In many ways, Tommy protected me from my dysfunctional family, but he went to the extreme. He controlled and patrolled me. Tommy and his stranglehold on my movements seemed a fair price to pay for getting to do the work I had always dreamed of. He had my life, but I had my music. In the very beginning, I did feel protected by him. I definitely felt that we had um, a bond in music, for sure. 
Um, I, I felt that he believed in me. Um, and that was huge. I didn't feel that, um, support as a person though. Like I didn't feel like he got the fact that I was also, you know, a human being with my own feelings and thoughts. The power dynamics were never what they should have been in a real relationship. It's ironic, you know, my voice was being heard by millions of people, you know, on a label that he controlled, but my actual voice as a, as a woman, as a human being, was really um, kind of shushed. Tommy doesn't deny the fact that he kept Mariah in a box. He doesn't deny that she wasn't allowed to do much without him or have much say when it came to her schedule. What he does deny, however, is that his actions were intended to control and or hurt Mariah in any way. To Mariah, he was controlling. To Tommy, he was nurturing and guiding her career. After working on Mariah's first album for almost two years, it was released in 1990. Mariah's self-titled first album shot to number one and became an instant hit. While still riding the wave of her first album, Tommy had Mariah gearing up for her second, which would also be a hit. In his eyes, they needed to keep the momentum going, which meant that he needed to keep her focused. He writes, Everything in her short career had unfolded as if it had been perfectly choreographed. The debut on Arsenio Hall, the marketing that helped push sales of her first album past 10 million units, the two Grammys, the release of her single Emotions months before it came out on her second album, my impending divorce, everything was going according to plan. But Mariah felt that the workload wasn't giving her the time to go out and celebrate her success. Having seen it all, my feeling was that there'd be plenty of time for Mariah to celebrate just a little ways down the road. I'm not talking 10 years, just a few. I encouraged her to stay focused on the big picture. Those suggestions began to form tiny cracks between us. She was 20 years old and never really had a childhood to begin with, but we had to keep our eyes on the prize. We were living together now, and for the first time in her life, Mariah had a sense of stability at home, a sense of grounding, a sense of family, a sense of financial security, a sense of real love and true caring. In the early 90s, Mariah's career soared as she released hit after hit after hit. Her relationship with Tommy also moved forward, with the couple getting married on June 5, 1993. Mariah was 23 and Tommy was 44. In their books, they both detail the reasons as to why they got married. Mariah writes, Many reasonable people have questioned why I married Tommy, but none of them questioned the decision more than I did. I knew I would lose power as a person, and I was already completely suffering emotionally in the relationship. The personal power dynamic between us was never equal. I hoped that if I gave him the thing that he so adamantly wanted, this marriage, that I believed he thought would legitimize him or a quiet chatter about him having an affair with an artist on the label. I thought this marriage would change him. I prayed that in doing so, he would calm down and loosen his grip on my life. I married Tommy because I thought it was the only way for me to survive in that relationship. I saw the power he could put behind my music, and he saw the power my music could give him. If only he had known how to give me the respect I was due as a human being. Mariah was in love. She met this man who was not only like a father figure and a rescuer, but, you know, someone who paid a lot of attention to her. I mean, he was very romantic and very attentive, but she told People Magazine a few months after she got married, yeah, we're in love, this is great, but we do fight a lot. The problems kind of started happening as I started making videos and started being seen by people in a way that I guess was threatening to him. Baby, look what we become. I was in it and then it turned into something else. So it was just a gradual process of let me make this work. Maybe if I get married, it'll work because then he won't feel threatened. Tommy and Mariah's wedding was a star-studded event and a fairy tale in the eyes of many. But for Tommy, his children from his previous marriage were struggling. He writes, My children were crying because they felt terribly out of place and uncomfortable, as they knew in their bones this wasn't right. So many people understood beforehand that it just wasn't right and tried to tell me time after time as best as they could. It's true. I wanted to get married. But it certainly wasn't like I was forcing this on anyone. After our wedding, it felt like we were both happy. 
the only thing left to complete the fairy tale was to build her a castle. And a castle he did build. Upon their wedding, Tommy and Mariah had their dream house built in Bedford, New York. It had a salon for Mariah to get her hair done, a world-class state-of-the-art recording studio, and an indoor swimming pool, among other things. To outsiders, this estate was a dream come true. To Mariah, however, it was a prison, a place where she was controlled, monitored, and held against her will. She was this little porcelain doll. You know, she was Tommy's, Tommy's kept doll. To be brought out, to stand there, you know, to be the good girl, and to sing her ballads, to sing her heart out, and to wow us all as she can with her voice. She moves into this big mansion and realizes that she's living now with this very controlling person. I mean, Tommy, she says, does not allow her to leave. But is it true that you would head for a cheeseburger at McDonald's and you'd be getting phone calls on your cell phone? Where the heck are you going? Basically, yeah. How intimidating was that? I'm trying to think of the right word to express exactly what it was. It was stifling. At one point, you and your friends referred to this Bedford mansion you lived in with Tommy Mottola as Sing Sing. <laughs> so I'm supposed to believe that you were almost in prison there and you were expected to sing. To sing. sing. <laughs> in her book, Mariah details an incident where music producer Jermaine Dupri and rapper The Brat went on to the estate for a recording session. In recent interviews, Jermaine Dupri and The Brat have both spoken out about what happened that day. Take a look. So I went to do Always Be My Baby remix right. with Brat and mm. Escape at her house. And she lived next door to Ralph Lauren and uh, like upstate New York, right? Hold on. And um, she couldn't never really drive because mm. she's Mariah Carey. And, they and she was married to Tommy so he wouldn't let her drive. It's a security have to drive her around. But she ain't like that. She wanted mm -hmm. to get out and drive. Mm -hmm. So I'm downstairs making a beat mm -hmm. in the studio. Her and Brat, they done broke out, took a car and left. No security, don't know what's going on. <clears throat> so I'm downstairs trying to make the song, get the r song right. And then all of a sudden it's <clears throat> like alarm going off in the house. And people <laughs> running around <laughs> frantic, like, yo, what the f is going on? And like... Then you go to Tommy Matola house, I guess I can say this. Tommy Matola house, you know, like people outside with, they, with guns. Tommy and everybody's looking for Mariah. She's disappeared. Right. She's completely left the house. And I'm downstairs, and, and Brat is with her, so they think I know, think I'm in on it. Right. So I'm getting, like, questioned. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Right. And they actually really questioning me, like, you know, what, you you know what's happening with this going? is Tom Matola and Mariah's people. Yeah, yeah, okay. everybody's Let's going crazy. The security. And they went to McDonald's. <laughs> so I'm in this house getting basically questioned. Right. Like, where's this woman at? And right. I don't know, I don't know nothing about it, but they're not they not believing me. Mm -hmm. Right? And they the security dude's about to get fired because mm -hmm. he allowed her to she snuck out. It was just like some real crazy shit. Oh, oh, Mariah's security. Yeah. Oh, he's about to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, he should be Tommy's going to kill him. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely. like, you're about to die because you let her get out this house without, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that was crazy to me because I'm, I'm, I'm fresh, like, just from Atlanta. I'm, I'm like, what's going on right now? And I'm way out in this house that's way out upstate New York. And it's like, that was crazy right there. Like, right. just to see a, 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 a star that level you know, actually want to do something that's different in their life. Right. And she did it. And it was like to see people panicking and almost like beat me up. Though Mariah's career was thriving, her marriage to Tommy was crumbling. The two had constant spats, which ultimately began to affect their work relationship. Eventually, Tommy suggested they go to couples therapy, but only with his therapist. Mariah writes, it had gotten to the point where Tommy's very presence to me was a hostile occupation. Tiptoeing around and protecting myself was my daily existence. Being married to him really was the equivalent of having a strict father who ruled with fear and controlled everything you did. I kept hoping he would just ease up and give me space to just be. 
the, the the sad part is that she was like a, a a princess trapped in a castle because we had to whisper to talk. It was microphones in the walls and stuff. Every time she moved, the security went with her. If she would laugh or something too hard, security would come stop her and see what she was doing. It was like it, it was crazy. So, yeah, it, it was crazy. She it's it's all in her book, but but yeah. Anytime she would smile or look happy, they would come shut it down. It was sad. It was something. I'm telling you. And Tommy Matola didn't care about that. They they probably were scared that she went off somewhere with me. But I was like, girl, these your cars and they just sitting here, you ain't doing nothing with it. let's go. And we got in trouble. We got back, they whisked her off and we ain't see her for like an hour or something than when she finally came back in to finish. So was you know, Tom, Tommy Matola in the house? Yeah, he was in the house. And so yeah, they whisked they the whisked her off and took her to him like Probably, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know what what happened after that, but she it was like she didn't come out for a while. She probably got fussed at or whatever. She couldn't do nothing. She couldn't do nothing. Many rumors began to spread regarding the nature of their relationship. Several outlets reported that Mariah was locked away like a prisoner at their estate. Reports stated that Tommy controlled Mariah's entire life. In his book, Tommy addresses these claims, writing, Look, here's the reality. The people in her entourage began to spin stories that Mariah was locked in with security guards all around her, when the truth is that so many nights, while I was at home sleeping, preparing for my next 24-hour day, she was out hanging out at clubs and coming back at daybreak. Mistrust and my anxiety was mounting. There have been so many stories in the press about Mariah and me, with me being described as a Spengali, restrictive, controlling, and on and on and on. Lots of crap. If you've read George DeMaurier's novel Trilby, you know that Svengali is a fictional character who hypnotized people and controlled them with evil intent. So that characterization is simply BS. No, I did not hypnotize Mariah. No, I did not hypnotize her into selling 200 million albums. No, I did not chain her to a recording studio in the mansion we built after we were married. I ran through cement walls for Mariah, especially to protect her in so many situations. I want to go through some of the rumors that have been written that we've all heard. You have not talked about them until now. So let's let's clear the deck. Let's talk about them. Describe to me, for example, what some of the restrictions were that, that, that you found so difficult. Well, it's not like he had a rule book and he said, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. It's just that the nature of our relationship, because he was so much, because he was older and because he was more experienced in every way, I guess it became oppressive in a lot of ways. Tommy didn't like the way you dressed. He would not have liked you to dress like this. Well, towards the end, it, it got a little bit better, but you know, he, put, yeah, he had some issues with that. He wanted you to wear the high neck, the long hair, you know, to look a little more demure. Probably. You got movie offers. Tommy did not want you to act, to be in movies. Right. Why not? Probably because he felt that, well, what he says is because he felt it would be bad for my career. In the mid-90s, Mariah started to break free from Tommy's control with the help of his therapist and baseball player, Derek Jeter. An unexpected run-in with the athlete would turn into an emotional affair. Like Mariah, Derek came from an interracial family, and she felt like she could relate to him as they resonated on a very deep level. Mariah's affair with Derek would be the catalyst to her marriage and ultimately give her the confidence she needed to break away. She writes, The rendezvous with Derek was just the push I needed to cross over into the promised land. I had proof that I could have something beautiful on the other side of the hell that was my marriage. Tommy's dark reign over me was now crumbling. Derek was outside of Tommy's world. Tommy couldn't destroy him. And I felt the possibility of my destruction coming to an end. Derek served a high purpose in my life. He was the catalyst I needed to get out from under Tommy's crippling control and get in touch with my sensuality. I had to go get what I wanted, and I wanted freedom. If I had just been allowed to express myself more or just been allowed to really, you know, be who I am, you know, go out more, be who I am, be a free spirit, because I was never looking to do anything. It's not like I was going out looking to... Yeah. Yeah, I went you weren't looking for guys, or you weren't. No. You just wanted to go out and experience what people your age were doing, yeah. and people in your profession were doing, yeah. just to experience the kind of sense of what it's like to be. Yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't. I think that's part of the reason why I feel like I'm still grounded yeah. is because I didn't experience fame when it initially happened to me. I didn't experience that whole thing where your brain gets twisted and you're like, I'm young and I'm famous and I'm going out and I'm doing this. And I sort of went into this like, I was very sequestered in this whole, you know, just with everybody around me. It was very much like you're almost in a cocoon. Yeah. And I'm not saying that to, to say anything negative about about anybody else. I'm really not. I mean, it happened. It's over. Tommy and Mariah would separate in 1997. Mariah writes that on the night that she officially left Tommy, they had a very bad argument. And in his rage, he grabbed the knife and ran it down the side of her face while threatening her. That incident was the final and last straw. Though Mariah and Tommy's divorce was finalized in 1998, He would, however, continue to control her life. She was still the biggest star at Sony Music, and he was still the president. Were you worried when Mariah and Tommy broke up and he's the head of Sony Records? Absolutely. You know that, yeah? Absolutely. Petrified. Because I felt if he can make a career, Mm -hmm. he can break a career. Do you think that he might do that, try to hurt her career? I hope not. I hope he, he doesn't. But there's that doubt. Always. Are you afraid? Let's see. He listens to this interview and he gets mad. And he, and he may not want to put out your next album. I mean, he is in control in that sense of your albums. Yes? He's the head of the company, so he's the one who's calling the shots. And really, I would like to have a good relationship. Mariah details how Tommy sabotaged, blackballed, and manipulated her career in the years that followed. According to Mariah, he would keep tabs on her interfere in her music, and ultimately make her life a living hell. Eventually, Mariah wanted out of Sony Music. Unfortunately for her, Tommy wouldn't let her go that easily. She writes, No matter who I was talking to at the label, Tommy was still in control. There was no one above him at Sony Music. Everything had to go through him. When I began having conversations about getting off the label, I was blocked at every turn. Tommy had a vendetta against me and he used his power to hold me hostage. Mariah Carey. After divorcing Tommy, came to me crying. Crying. She was crying so bad I had to hold her. And she said to me that this is an evil man. And Michael, this man follows me, she said. He taps her phones, and he's very, very evil, and she doesn't trust him. And he is a horrible human being, and we, we have to continue our drive until he's terminated. Oh, there you go! Mariah would be left with no choice but to fly to Japan and meet with the president and chairman of Sony Corporation in order to work out a deal to get her out of her contract. And to her excitement, a deal was made. The final deal regarding Mariah's contract with Sony included four albums to be delivered over the next five years. Mariah would then sign with EMI on April 2, 2001. Her contract with them came with a big paycheck of $80 million. Though Mariah seemingly broke free from the restraints of Tommy, he still had a stronghold on her career, even at her new label. In her book, Mariah details some of the ways Tommy sabotaged her career during this period. The movie Glitter that Mariah put together was being produced by Columbia Pictures, which was owned by Sony. Mariah had high hopes for Glitter, but when it came out, it was met with dismal ratings and severe criticism. In essence, it flopped. She writes, Much of what went wrong with Glitter led back to Tommy. He was angry about the divorce and my departure from Sony, and he used all his power and connections to punish me. Tommy and his cronies went as far as taking promotional items out of the record stores. He interfered with the Glitter soundtrack, Loverboy, the first song off the Glitter soundtrack. I had written the lyrics and used the song Firecracker by Yellow Magic Orchestra as the sample. I had chosen the song and paid to have it used in the movie. After hearing my new song using the same sample I used, Sony rushed to make a single for another female entertainer on their label. They used the Firecracker sample and released it before Loverboy. 
The female entertainer Mariah is referring to that was used to help sabotage her career was Jennifer Lopez. Let me give you the story of Amriel. Can I give you the story of Amriel? Amriel was so crazy, and I'm gonna throw Tommy under the bus a little bit, but I don't give a about Tommy, so it's all good. It's all good. I'm talking about Tommy Mottola. Yeah, yeah, got it. So Tommy Mottola calls me at like 6 Mm a.m. 6, 7, it was obscenely early, and he calls me because he found out me and Rule made a record with Mariah Carey. Mm. And at the time, he hated Mariah Carey. So he was pumping Jennifer Lopez to compete. Mm. So he calls me 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, what's up, Tom? What the f*** do you want? This, 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 this. Oh, he says, Irv, I need you to do me a favor. I said, what's up? I need you to make a record with J-Lo, but I want you to put Ja Rule on it and make it a duet kind of a record. So immediately when he says that, I'm like, this yeah. He knows we just did this shit with Mariah, which right. was a duty record, and he's trying to f- Mariah. Then I went into the creative part. I said, look, man, I want total creative control. I don't want you telling me what to make. If I got to do a record with J-Lo, I want to do it however the f- I want to do it. Mm-hmm. He says, I don't give a f- what you do as long as it's a duet with right. Ja. I said, cool. At the last minute, Mariah would switch the sample to Candy by Cameo in an attempt to salvage the record. When Lover Boy came out, it hit number two on the charts, not number one, making her new label panic. It was the summer of 2001 when Mariah's career and personal life hit an all time low. Her anxiety was rising, she was getting no sleep, and Tommy was doing everything in his power to take her down. To help promote her movie and soundtrack, Mariah made a special appearance on MTV's show TRL. Her appearance, though, and behavior was set off a media frenzy. Hi, Carson. In 2001, Mariah Carey surprised me on the set of MTV's Total Request Live. Mariah Carey is stripping on TRL right now. Her behavior was erratic. What are you doing? What did you bring? I'm trying to, you're my therapy session right now, Carson. You see, this is every now and then. Somebody needs a little therapy. Yes, I understand that. Today is that moment for me. The tabloids and media blasted Mariah for her stunt on TRL. She writes, The tabloids and celebrity press at large acted like I'd actually stripped butt naked and given Carson a lap dance on TV. The press devoured my silly stunt and me right along with it. It was the first time I had experienced the phenomenon of a public fail that woke the monster in the media, that vicious vampire that gains its strength by feeding on the weaknesses of the vulnerable. Some mainstream media is a glutton for negative energy and fear. It places a mask over the pain and presents it as entertainment. It was visible, and I was vulnerable. And when the Cinderella of Sony took a fall, no king's horses or men tried to set the record straight, pick me up, or put me back together again. Rather, they fed on the spectacle and just wanted more stumbles, embarrassment, and ridicule. The monster in the media is only satisfied when you are destroyed. We're all just living in the moment of being positive, and there's like people called haters. No, 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 And we give them positivity. Let's go. go. You see, I can't even get a minute. Bye. Then she left this rambling message on her website for her fans. I just want you to know that I'm trying to understand things in life right now, and so I really don't feel that I should be doing music right now. I just can't trust anybody anymore right now because I don't understand what's going on. Hours after leaving the message, she was admitted to the hospital. Mariah was running on little sleep, fear, anxiety, and frustration, and eventually checked herself into a rehabilitation facility for exhaustion. When that happened, the media reported it as her having a mental breakdown that landed her in the nutty home. At the time, there was a lot going on. R&B singer Aaliyah had just died in a plane crash. Terrorists flew planes into the Twin Towers on 9-11, and the overall morale of America was down. Uncertain of Mariah's success with the label, EMI Records bought her out of her contract and let her go. Mariah's life had come to a standstill in 2001. What she thought was just exhaustion turned out to be her experiencing a manic episode. Upon her stay at the rehab facility, Mariah was diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder. There was a headline and it said, Mariah Meltdown. Love a headline. (laughs) You know, again, I guess we could, I guess I could say that's true. Well, tell me what happened. I neglected myself as a human being. At a certain point, I said, you know what? Forget this. Forget this whole 
career at this moment because it's too much for me. And that's when I started to get mad. I was like, look, I'm too fatigued. I'm overly tired. I can't do it as a human being. And nobody was hearing those last two words, human being. They were used to the Mariah that always says, come on, let's fight, let's go. They just weren't used to me ever saying no. So physically, you're a wreck. Mm -hmm. You're exhausted. Yeah. Emotionally. Emotionally, that in and of itself was enough to make me just say, you know what, I can't handle this anymore. I went up to my mom's house and I literally collapsed. You're in a ball on the floor, you're lying on the bed. Yeah, I, I pretty much blacked out and I didn't, you know, I didn't know, my mother didn't know what to do. She called 911. Yeah, she called 911, which was not the star, the, you know, the superstar thing to do. This happens with a lot of celebrities, I'm sure, but we never hear about them because usually they have their professional people cleaning it all up. You know, my mom is just, my mother and she got concerned and that's the way she deals with things so i went with and i said maybe if i do go to the hospital people will realize i'm a person it's another it's a, it's one way of saying i'm serious here right. folks exactly this, this is this is crucial hello exactly so because i did that i expected okay maybe now they'll relax and realize this is serious did you attempt suicide no absolutely not i am not empowered to take my life that's god's choice when it's time for me to go and that's what hurt me. When they wrote that, that really got they to me. They wrote there were cuts on your body. I know. And I was like, can these people come and inspect my body? I was like, must I go on TV and be like, here you go. If I were to say you had a nervous breakdown. I would say no, no, a nervous breakdown is not accurate. Because a nervous breakdown, you know, you don't recover from so quickly. All I really needed was like five hours sleep. Tommy's influence in the industry was no joke. And according to Mariah, he almost broke her. But Mariah would bounce back as she signed with Island Records in 2002 and make a serious comeback. In the years that followed, Mariah released number one hits, sold millions of records, and is one of the top-selling female artists in history. So where does Mariah stand with Tommy Mottola? Upon the release of his book, this is what Tommy had to say about Mariah. Now, we, Ma Mariah Carey, this your relationship with Mariah is legendary. You know, I know you, you. I know you don't get you don't cringe having to talk about this. I'm sure, Mariah, you met her. <laughs> you met her as an artist, and then uh, you went on to marry her. Uh, when you see her today, like on American Idol, I'm so happy for her because you know I think finally she's really got to a place where um, she can enjoy all of this. Mm -hmm. This is a long journey and a long struggle for her too. You know, to get to where she is now. Um, and have two babies, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I look at it and uh, and I feel good about the fact of where she is now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel even better about the work that we did that gave and will give a lasting imprint of everything she's ever done uh, forever. Now, where does Mariah stand with her siblings? Her sister Allison was diagnosed with HIV in the 90s and has been in and out of the hospital over the years for different addictions. According to Mariah, she has footed the bill for Allison's treatment on multiple occasions and has financially supported her. In a recent interview, however, Allison is begging and pleading for Mariah to help her. Mariah, I love you, and I desperately need your help. Please don't abandon me like this. Mariah's relationship with her brother Morgan is also strained, Upon the release of her book, Morgan sued Mariah for defamation. In an interview with Radar Online, Morgan had the following message. She is, um, has been taking bipolar meds since 2001. So mixing those medications with alcohol, especially in the quantities that she drinks, sooner or later, it's not going to end happily ever after. I think Michael Jackson, I think Whitney Houston... Um, especially at this point in her career and her life, um, there's, there's no question that she is worth much more to a variety of interests dead than she is alive. I would be hard pressed to think of any time since Tommy when I didn't see her with a glass in her hand. I don't, I don't have, I don't think that it's unlikely that her behavior could culminate in her demise. Um, I, I think it's suicidal behavior. I'm just saying it's not, I don't believe it's her saying, ah, yippee-yay, I think I'm going to commit suicide. 
God. I think that she's so omnipotent. I think that the ego is so out of control that she feels like the rules of physics don't apply to her because she's Mariah Carey. She, you know, eternally 16. What is your message even to Mariah? Be safe. Be honest. Be safe. Lead to the people around her. Be careful. But my message would be, um, consider yourself on notice. If she suffers an untimely death, it's on her circle. As Mariah closes out her book, she writes the following. In the middle of a violent storm, very young, I was given a glimpse of God's vision for me. As a child, awakened to my dream, I believed with my entire being in what I was meant to do and who I was meant to be long before anyone else did. And holding on to that belief required everything I had. Along the way, I was given signs of hope, but mostly I faced chaos and calamity. The toughest truth was that the people I loved the most hurt me the worst. The ones closest to me were the ones who came closest to stripping me of my dreams. If I have learned anything in this life worth sharing, it is, protect your dreams. Even in the face of disadvantages and dysfunction, you can't let anybody define, control, or take away your vision of your life. Not your mother, brother, sister, father, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, fake friend, boss, bully, bigot, manager, partner, assistant, critic, cousin, uncle, auntie, classmate, Mogul, predator, influencer, president, false preacher, fake teacher, coworker, frenemy with a phone, coward with a camera, or chicken with a keyboard. In the end, and in the beginning, it's all about faith for me. I can't define it, but it has defined me. Okay, so I was 18 years old when I got my first record deal. A lot of very powerful men controlled my career, what I wore, who I worked with, and every aspect of my overall image. Believe me, that can be very intimidating and confining to a young girl just getting started, trying to express herself artistically. It took a lot of hard work, inner strength, and believing in myself, but slowly I gained the courage to emerge from that stifling control by a group of men, we love men, but you know, they could never understand or embrace the essence of who I truly am. I wanna thank each woman in this room and all the women who have come forward with their truths, their harrowing experiences, and above all, their triumphs over the misogynistic society of corporate asses that we deal with every day.